Uh, Morena, for now. I'd like to start with a phrase, I've Googled you. I want you to remember it because it's crucial to this story. Matthew asked me 10 minutes ago if Ed's legacy would be happy with what has been happening here in the past few days. And uh, I can assuredly tell you that the answer to that is yes. You asked me if I could try and uh, express something of Edmund Hillary the man. I should stress to you that while I had the enormous privilege of knowing Edmund Hillary the man for four years, I didn't meet him until he was 83. And I met him because I had had a half-assed idea in terms of a change of career and suggested to some very good friends, including my brother of some 30 years here, Anaki Goodall, who's the chairman of the Hillary Institute, that we might like to create a legacy internationally for Sir Edmund's remarkable leadership work. And what we meant by that was not just the obvious heroics that he's well known for. Everest, the traverse of the ice, Dan telling us yesterday wonderfully he's about to do the same thing, but Dan's going to be traversing the ice with highly sophisticated tech, which many of you have had a hand in providing. Ed did it in a tractor. <coughs> Similarly, there's some rather wonderful photographs if you haven't seen them. Um, have a look. Ty and I managed to source after some time, thanks to Peter Hillary, uh, rights to some of the National Geographic photography. And there are some wonderful photographs from the National um, uh, Archives um, in the UK uh, of that. And one of them is of a tractor hanging over the edge of one of these crevasses. The other thing, of course, is that the Everest climb itself, speaking of technical issues, while today uh, relatively commonplace, in fact, arguably now being exploited, um, of course, at that time, particularly the traverse of the Hillary Step, which is the last piece of the mountain, which juts out, was an extraordinary achievement. But again, Ed would tell you that it was an achievement which was certainly not his alone. It was the product of an extraordinary team effort coordinated by John Hunt, who was a remarkable Englishman, and of course supported by the Sherpa communities of the region, um, without whom it simply would not have been possible. The point about what we were trying to do, however, was that for 55 years, post those heroic ventures, Ed gave his life largely to building capacity in the Nepalese valleys uh, in his way of giving back to the communities who had supported him. And as a result, there are now generations of doctors and pilots and teachers from that part of the world who would candidly have not had that kind of an opportunity. He built 14 bridges, five hospitals, 23 schools. And when I say he built them, he built them <coughs> physically with teams of Kiwis and teams of internationals who that were all part of that. So the spirit of this man was far broader than just, if you will, the extraordinary hero's journey stuff that he is uh, well known for. So our ambition was to try and honor 
the core yes. driving passion of this man's leadership. And our task was to build an organization which could, in its turn, look for people who would honor that tradition. And so we built, quite quickly, uh, an international board, um, many of whom are, in fact, still with us. Anarchy and I did a review last year and were, frankly, humbled to find that after a decade um, absent um, death, and we lost Ray Anderson to cancer, and Bridget Cullerton, a wonderful Belizean um, feminist leader to cancer, um, they are all still with us. Helen Clark is still the patron. She sent greetings last night to you all. Um, she has, of course, had a very good weekend um, <laughs> in terms of her protege um, having a, now assumed power. Um, so we then, having established this board and having established um, a group um, uh, of exceptional um, caliber, to help us in this search program, um, we set about doing just that. And so the first laureate was um, chosen in 2009. I am the founding director of the organization, but frankly, I'm a glorified scout. What do I do? I come up with a short list of six by the 31st of March every year, and I give it to that board. And Anaki chairs that board, and he makes the hard decisions with the board, and I step out of the way. Um, and um, the first um, uh, remarkable leader was Jeremy Leggett, who may be well known to uh, some of you at least. Uh, Jeremy, of course, famous for his work in the solar industry, <coughs> equally famous for having founded Carbon Tracker, uh, Stranded Assets. Um, he's written four or five books. Um, he's a, a powerhouse um, in, in Europe. Um, and of course, his dominant driver uh, is climate change. Um, he was followed by my bossy friend here, who's now left the building. She's got bored with me already. Oh, no, she's moved. Oh, here we are. Um, and um, Peggy and I... I'm posting this video, Mark. Oh, right. Oh, dear. Live. Um, suffice to say, I've spent many an energetic day in Shanghai with Peggy. And when I say energetic, I mean, I've been a bit crook, as some of you may have noticed in the last 24 hours. Believe me, if you go spend a day with her in Shanghai, you'll be dead at the end of the day. <laughs> Just utterly exhausting, um, but rather wonderfully productive. And Peggy, of course, is an enormously gifted bridge head um, between the extraordinary opportunity uh, that China represents in, in terms of the larger challenges we confront. Um, she was followed um, by uh, Amy Christensen, who runs the Sun Valley Institute, Amy was a Beltway girl. She's, she's worked for several presidential administrations in Washington. Um, she's a remarkable convener um, of gatherings of key influences um, and has had a, a, a very real impact on policy. Uh, she's a bit uh, depressed at the moment, as you can imagine. Um, and um, it's been a difficult journey. Uh, moving on, um, next in line is the extraordinary Atosa Sultani. For those of you who haven't uh, heard of Atosa, she's the founder of Amazon Watch. Um, basically her story was at the age of 13, she was vaulted uh, from Tehran to Akron, Ohio, uh, when the Shah was overthrown. And um, she, at the age of um, 19, uh, was called to go to the Amazon. And she didn't understand why, but once she was there, she decided that was what her life was going to be, and indeed it has been for the last 30-some years. Uh, Atosa was followed um, in turn by the remarkable, uh, the only um, Tuakana Taina, really, in terms of our country, um, close to us in that sense. The president, former president of Kiribati, Anoti Tong, uh, confronted, again, as many of you may know, with the reality of 103,000 population living on atolls which at most have about a decade left. Um, this is not um, fiction, this is fact. Um, every two weeks, um, um, the Tarawa Atoll, a famous site of the uh, battle between the Americans and the Japanese in the Second World War, is washed over, it salinates their water, their um, 
coconuts are fifty percent of what they used to be. Yada yada yada. Um, a lot of people tell you that his father, at eighty-seven, um, spends his time rebuilding the rock wall in front of his uh, urupa. We're talking about a four thousand year whakapapa here. Um, he will die there. And once he is 67, he will die there. He cannot make and will not make the same promise for his eight children. So in terms of the migration issue, which of course is another one of the existential challenges of the age, these uh, islands are in fact the canaries in the cage and we need to get very serious and I'm hopeful that this administration in fact um, do you think, Roderick, they might, they, we might even be able to get some movement here in terms of getting serious about how we can support our cousins uh, up in the Pacific? Um, Anoti was uh, followed um, <coughs> by <laughs> Mike Brune. Thank you, Piggy. Yes. Uh, Mike is the head of the Sierra Club, um, executive director of the Sierra Club. Shortly after Trump's election, for the first time in a, a, almost a decade, we found our own website under uh, heavy attack. Uh, it was under heavy attack uh, from trolling, uh, from people who felt that because we had an association with Mike, who was clearly somebody who needed to be um, trolled uh, um, badly uh, and was an enemy of the state, um, they needed to reach out and hit every possible um, access point of his life. Um, so we had the unusual situation where we had to say, uh, as an institute, we acknowledge uh, the Second Amendment, uh, sorry, the First Amendment, um, but <laughs> we will not um, allow um, um, unsigned, um, basically bad shit behaviour. And. Uh, uh, so Mike, interestingly, however, in terms of the resistance in the US, um, he's an extraordinarily gifted communicator. I've spent time with him in Kentucky, in, in, in the heartland of uh, the coal economy. Um, with the help of Michael Bloomberg, he has been largely responsible, his organization, for shutting down over 300 coal mines in the US in, in the last decade. Um, but his ability to actually work with those communities around what actually now is crucial, which is workforce transition. Uh, because regardless of what Donald might think, coal ain't coming back. And uh, so the reality there is um, that Mike, in fact, has seen a decided uptick, uptick in support uh, financially for the work of the Sierra Club and membership uh, rising. And uh, so as Obama said the other night, uh, when he came out publicly ready for the first time, um, there is still capacity here to rally, there is still capacity here for hope. Uh, yes, we can. So Mike uh, is, is at the forefront of that. Um, uh, then we, we um, found ourselves working with uh, a remarkable economist, um, uh, an Englishman called Tim Jackson, who is responsible for um, the seminal work, um, which is basically um, um, looking at the issue of limits to growth um, and uh, prosperity uh, without endless growth. Uh, and for those of you who are interested in this kind of thinking, um, he is uh, a very, very able uh, communicator of this and again has, has written several um, key books in this regard. He's um, based in the UK. And then quickly moving on here, our current laureate, as you heard yesterday, who we will be bringing uh, to this gathering in April, is the extraordinary Swede Johan Rockström, um, who is the guy who invented the planetary boundaries idea. Um, he is also, uh, in terms of Peggy's work, um, uh, an advisory chairman to the EAT Forum internationally. He is uh, an extraordinarily um, gifted uh, communicator. Uh, but he's thrown us a challenge in terms of the year that we work with these laureates and the challenge is he wants to write the seminal work called The Best Story in Town. And speaking of, I've Googled you, he doesn't want it to be uh, in technical terms anything other than an old paperback which you can shove in your back pocket and buy for nine ninety nine, and he wants to sell at least 10 million copies of it. So his challenge is um, Firstly, the best story in town, it better be damn good. There's a few other books which claim that, notably the Bible and the Quran. And things like that. Um, but what Johan's trying to say is that we're living in an extraordinary time 
in the sense of the challenges we face, and let's not under underestimate those, of course, but also it's like a, a renaissance time, that we have an enormous capacity um, because of the unique nature of this age to really create the future that we would like to see if we're prepared to get serious about that and do the work. Um, so, um, yes, um, by the time he gets here, just as Charles did last year, we're hoping that we'll hear from Johan something of the book. You know, he's, uh, he's wanting the visit with us to be part of that process and it will be published for Christmas uh, in uh, 2018. So, coming all the way back um, to finish um, the I've Googled you link is that when I first met Ed, um, and Anarchy and David Kagan and Chris Doig and the others had encouraged me that it was probably a good idea, I talked to the man, um, having hatched this idea, um, I was terrified. The first thing I had to do was get past his shield. And his shield was a woman who was legendary in Auckland at the time. She was known as the Rock Violet. Um, and um, she ran um, an organisation which celebrated um, Kiwis who were outstanding public figures. And she provided opportunities for them to reach out and speak, and Ed was one of her clients. So before I could even get to Ed, I had to get past Deborah. And Deborah, speaking of cancer, was in fact dying of cancer. And she'd been given uh, three months to live. Um, and uh, so she wasn't in a good state, and, uh, and I wasn't in a good state. And, um, but she was, couldn't be less like a Rottweiler. She was, she was absolutely delightful and very generous. And within a week I found myself meeting Ed and June. Uh, and June uh, Mayhew, who's Ed's second wife of course, um, Ed's great friend Peter Mayhew, who tragically uh, died uh, on the Erebus uh, crash. Um, uh, June and Ed got together some years after that. Um, and she's also a terrifying figure. Um, and um, so June and Ed, uh, I walked into their home in Remuera and Ed strode across the room and he said, I've Googled you. <laughs> and this was coming from an 83 year old. And as you can tell, I'm not usually stumped for words, uh, but I was stumped. And uh, he'd had a one pager only in prep. Um, so before I could say anything else, he said, where? are we going to do this? Mm -hmm. Not should we do it? Where? And I said, well, it, it's international focused, Ed, and you know, Helen's involved, and all these good folks are going to put their hands up. And he said, well, we need to do it inside of the manga. And the manga, of course, that he was talking about was Auraki, where he had spent his youth cook in the South Island, um, climbing and training. Um, and um, so the New Zealand trustees, the international board being one layer of this, the New Zealand trustees uh, were based in Christchurch as an outcome. But the joy of working with Ed thereafter was that the only condition he put on it was that we didn't start until we were ready. And um, he then, uh, well, basically we raised a, an initial capital uh, loan fund of two and a half million and we were ready in that sense and we were ready to get the journey underway. And uh, he said, well, we're going to launch it. Um, I'm going to the ice for the last time. Um, we're going to launch it on the 22nd of January. And I said, that's my 50th birthday. And he looked at me as though I was confusing him with somebody who gave a damn. And um, <laughs> that's exactly what he did. Um, and uh, I spent the entirety of my 50th birthday on the phone fielding the media calls. Um, but that was not the burden that then befell us, sadly, because the following year, um, on my 51st birthday, uh, we attended his wake. Um, so he was literally only with us uh, for a three-year period. And, um, but it was an enormously um, enriching, personally, um, and very generous exchange, um, working with this quite remarkable man. Uh, at a time in his life when he knew he was failing, uh, but still had this enormous generosity of spirit and vision to reach out and say, yeah, let's do this. And also let's do this as a global citizen. Ed saw himself 
absolutely as Kiwi fundamentally, but he also saw himself, and of course in his daily practice, he was absolutely a global citizen. So to finish, Matthew, what we have here, he would be very happy with.